Kia ora. My name is Linda Bryder. I'm a historian of health and medicine, and it is my great pleasure to be speaking to you today on the history of Baby Week. Baby Week is a celebration of our most precious new family members. It also has an educational function, and in bringing together parents, and mothers in particular, provides the opportunity for families to make a difference to health services. These are the goals which the modern Baby Week share with the very first Baby Week to be hosted in Britain, which is the subject of my talk today, the 1917 National Baby Week. I will be explaining how those who ran the 1917 Baby Week used it as an opportunity to make a case for improved welfare services and social support for the poor. This was a massive public campaign, which was remarkably successful. Not many people know, for instance, that the founding of the Ministry of Health two years later owed much to their lobbying success. First, let me tell you something about Britain's 1917 National Baby Week. There were local variants of the event, but here I focus on London, which was central to the organising committee. The planned event in London included lectures, sermons, and a film made especially for the week, which was quite something at the time, and which was shown around the country. The centrepiece of the event in London was a huge exhibition in Central Hall, Westminster, with over 42 stalls and exhibits attracting 20,000 visitors. Patron to the event was Queen Mary, who opened the exhibition. We have to remember it was staged in the midst of the First World War, and undoubtedly was a welcome distraction from the horrors of war. Giving it a military flavour at the opening, a parade of about 100 women from welfare centres around London formed a guard of honour, holding not arms, but their babies, to the Queen as she passed down the aisle. Queen Mary reportedly admired the, quote, healthy, well-cared-for and beautifully dressed children. The opportunity to be part of this guard of honour was in fact so widely sought after that welfare centres had to draw lots to decide who would participate, an indication of how keenly these mothers embraced the event, or perhaps the opportunity to meet the Queen. The exhibits in the hall attracted thousands of visitors and were so popular that the organising committee decided in future they would produce pamphlets as bottlenecks built up with women blocking the aisles as they took notes. Clearly, these women sought out modern information on childcare that was on display. What were these exhibits? And why were they so popular? A prominent feature was hygiene in the home. This might sound obvious to you, but you have to remember the so-called germ theory of disease was a relatively recent discovery at the time, following developments in bacteriology in the late 19th century. These modern mothers sought the latest scientific information and advice. Breastfeeding was heavily promoted as a way of preventing infections, and specifically the major cause of infant death at the time, which was infant diarrhoea. Apart from the dangers of bottle feeding infants, the germ theory of disease targeted the common fly as an imminent danger to health. The exhibition included a model of a giant fly magnified 250 times, quite spectacular, 15 feet across its wings, and, to quote, reproducing in every particular the poisonous and dangerous characteristics of this household pest.
The National League for Physical Education picked up on this theme and offered a prize for an elementary school essay on Why I Should Kill That Fly. With 180,000 essays submitted, judging can't have been easy, but on the screen is the winning entry by 12-year-old Leonard H. Foster of Essex. Another feature of Baby Week was a film made by someone called Mrs. Irving. Who was Mrs. Irving? I wondered when I researched the event. I discovered that Mrs. Irving, who made the film and also played a central part in organising Baby Week, was Dorothea Irving, who'd been educated at Oxford, where she had joined the Shakespeare Theatrical Company. The daughter of an eminent lawyer, she had played a large part in voluntary infant welfare services in the early 20th century. In her speeches during Baby Week, she railed against greedy landlords and spoke of the criminal neglect by local boroughs of housing conditions. She hated the title of the then infant welfare centres, which were called Schools for Mothers, pointing out that, to quote her, there is nothing easier than lecturing mothers on their duty. There is nothing harder than affecting real improvement in the environment, food and treatment of the mothers and children themselves. She believed that, instead of schools for mothers, there should be schools for slum property owners, educating them about their responsibilities. Irving's film was about one of these welfare centres featuring a health visitor. Health visitors were employed by the centres to advise mothers. Irving played the health visitor herself, who assisted the mother who'd had a baby whilst her husband was away at war. The film ends with the husband's return from war and the statement that the young couple, when the war is over, are happy in a home built for them by a grateful country where there is air and space for the children to grow and play and labour-saving devices for the mother. This was Irving's aspiration. The film was primarily about the external environment, not teaching what were then called mothercraft skills. Others who led Baby Week shared this aspiration, encouraging people to lobby for change, as you can see from their alphabet for National Baby Week. A for arouse, arouse borough councils, D, nounce economic fallacies, etc., etc., two, prohibit questionable residences, and finally, exert your seal. This was about being politically proactive. At the opening of Baby Week in London, the Duchess of Marlborough put forward a resolution that Owing to the high infant mortality prevailing, the assembled citizens, quote, pledge themselves to inquire into the conditions which are responsible for this loss to the nation and undertake to use their influence to secure improved housing and sanitation together with adequate provision for the care of maternity and infancy in their own districts. The resolution was passed unanimously by a large crowd of women. But what was this loss to the nation she referred to? This poster explains it. It is more dangerous to be a baby in England than a soldier in France. This poster was the brainchild of Mrs Irving. And this kind of propaganda was smart. It gave their cause for infant welfare national significance. A National Baby Week leaflet prior to Baby Week had pointed out that nine soldiers had died every hour at the front, whilst 12 babies died at home. The women who ran the Central Council for National Baby Week were almost all upper class. I counted 10 titled ladies, six 
duchesses, three countesses, three marchionesses, and three viscountesses. These women had generally been involved in voluntary welfare in the early 20th century, which, like Irving, had politicised them and led them to demand government social reform for the working classes. They had been doing so before the war, but the war itself provided them with a real opportunity to further promote their cause. The fact that they drew on war mortality to emphasise the importance of infant welfare and that they were all upper-class women has led some historians to suggest that these ladies bountiful, so-called, were imperialistic, viewing babies as cannon fodder and mothers as breeders for nation and empire, and to claim that they patronised the poor. This could not be further from the truth. Instead, these women were very savvy in using the situation to promote a political cause they felt passionate about. They focused on social and economic reform. And these women and those who supported them were tremendously successful in their campaign. For instance, contributing pressure to set up a Ministry of Health following the war. In his history of the so-called struggle to set up the Ministry of Health in 1919, historian Frank Honigsbaum described the, quote, pressure exerted by millions of new female voters who ardently desired a ministry, tracing this back to the 1917 Baby Week. The concluding meeting of the 1917 Baby Week had unanimously passed a resolution that this meeting asked the government to take immediate steps to constitute a Ministry of Health. Other successes included the 1918 Maternity and Infant Welfare Act, which required local authorities to set up maternal and infant welfare committees, and the 1918 Midwives Act, which improved the conditions for midwives. To conclude then, those who orchestrated the 1917 Baby Week were responsible for bringing the issues relating to mothers and babies to public attention through staging what was a tremendously successful, non-threatening, carnival-like event during the war. Here's a glimpse of that carnival-like atmosphere at one of the local events. The Central Council, at an early stage of their planning, stated their determination that it would be impossible to be in England during the first week of July 1917 and not learn about the, quote, needs of infancy and motherhood. It was a huge public awareness exercise, which in the event made a difference. Baby weeks continued into the future, but none had the impact of this first event in 1917. The war had provided ammunition to those wishing to promote maternal and child welfare, and women had been effectively mobilised to support welfare reform. Thank you for listening, and I wish you every success for the 2023 Baby Week and into the future. Collectively, you can make a difference.